everyone, this is Julia with episode number 66 of the Mixology Talk podcast. It is time for another listener questions episode. We are way behind our, our questions list, so it is time to catch up. But before I do, I wanted to tell you about an idea that we had. One of the things that we were thinking about doing is actually doing some live podcast recordings with you guys in the chat box to send us your questions. If you would be interested in something like that, let us know in the comments for this episode, which will be at mixologytalk.com slash 66. If you're into that sort of thing, let us know. We might just make it happen. All right, let's get into it and answer some questions. So our first question is from Martin from Albuquerque, and he has a really, really good question that we actually get quite a bit. And to summarize, he says, how can I break into the bartending career? Everybody wants experience. It is, it is the catch-22 of starting out in any career, I think. Yeah, it's nobody wants to hire anybody without experience, but they're not willing to give you a shot, so you can't ever get experience. I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Martin. I've, I, I was kind of in that scenario when I first got into the hospitality industry as well. And it is really frustrating, but the good news is it can definitely be done. The first thing I'm going to suggest is to go ahead and actually listen to a podcast episode we did on exactly this topic. It's uh, episode number 51, I think, which uh, you can listen to either in your podcast player or at mixologytalk.com slash 51. Yeah, so to basically summarize, you can find a couple different easy ways into the business. First one is through catering, because... They'll hire pretty much anybody without experience, and it's a great way to get experience and earn good money. And I think it's it's a good sort of low pressure way to start as well. I think that uh, nobody, you know, you're not going to have 85 bottles behind the bar if you're catering. You're going to have a limited menu. You'll have maybe 10 bottles. Exactly. Yeah. It's, an e it's a way to ease into it. And it does make good money depending on the season, depending on where you live, and it puts it on your resume. Right. Absolutely. And just like anything, once you have one, then people will, will say, oh, okay, you've done this before. Um, another one, and the way I got into it was when I was interviewing, I told them I would basically take any job in the restaurant, but my end goal was to be a bartender. Um, and, and you're stubborn. Yeah, I am. I'm pretty stubborn. Um, <laughs> so it took me a while. It took me about six months, but I would ask every week. You know, not not to be annoying, but just like, hey, top of mind. You know, I really, I'll, I'll come in on my day off and train, but I really want to be a part mm -hmm. of the bar team. Yeah. Um, and it took me a while, but it, it totally panned out well, and, and I, I think loved it. It's definitely, don't overlook the fact that during those six months, you proved that you were a hard worker. You proved that you were, you were trainable. You were willing to, to do the stuff that wasn't fun. I think a lot of people glamorize bartending. So when folks saunter into a bar and say, I want to become a bartender, it's easy to write them off and say, you, you know, to think to yourself, well, you just want the glamorous side. You don't want the hard work. Right. And to be completely honest, what it always comes down to is personality. If you're Attitude. willing to show that, you know, you really want to do this, you're really excited about it, and there's nothing else that's going to get in your way, you're going to get a shot somewhere. Absolutely. Um, so definitely show the personality, show your willingness to do, you know, the hard work, um, and it'll definitely pan out for you. Yeah, because you can train bartending, but you definitely can't change somebody's attitude if they don't have a hospitality mindset. Right, absolutely. So our next question comes from Ireland. This one's from Mark in Dublin, and he is asking how a mojito should be made. Now, I think that every bartender probably has their own way of making a mojito, and and they I feel am, very strongly about it. Right. And most of them say, I don't want, I don't make mojitos. I'm out of mint. <laughs> it's usually, yep. it's Story usually of my life. Uh, it's usually the comment that you get. But there are, there's no right way or wrong way. There are preferences. Um, and, you know, you could argue all day long about that. But the way I typically make it, um, I think the, the really particular question that you had in there was, is it more like a daiquiri or is it more like a julep? And the big thing that really keep in mind is that the more you muddle the mint and the more you beat it up, the more bitter it's going to be. But you got to have muddled mint in a mojito. Yeah. I've had I've had moji mojitos that were basically just a simple sour with a sprig of mint on top, and I was kind of disappointed. Yeah, because I know uh, Jamie Boudreau, who runs, who owns and runs Canon, basically just kind of smacks the mint and a lot of it. Like he'll take half a bundle of mint smack it around a little bit to release the fragrance mm -hmm. and that's the only thing he does with it oh wow and there's other people which that will keep it, it nice and light it'll prevent it from getting bitter um, you'll get all the fragrance is yeah. kind of what he was looking for and 
you know, all that. But, you know, if you want to integrate it into the cocktail, it's a whole different story. Yeah. But I think, like you said, that with any sort of um, herb that has the the stick in it, mm -hmm. don't over muddle. You're right. going to bring out that bitterness. Right. Absolutely. And I will say that I do have one way I love mojitos uh, being made. And this is usually something I can only do in a couple bars or at the house is not to use simple syrup, actually. And it's to use um, cane juice, cane syrup, anything like demerara sugar, turbinado sugar, anything mm -hmm. like that. Because if you look at the distilling process of rum, that is one of the common ingredients down the line or up the line, whatever you want to call so it. So what's the flavor difference that you see from oh, that? Oh, it brings out more of that cane quality of the rum. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it's a totally different cocktail. Yum. That sounds yeah, amazing. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and you like mojitos, do yourself a favor. Next time you make a mojito... Make it with some kind of Demerara Turbinado sugar. And I would love to hear your feedback on that because the, when I tried it, it was like, well, why would I ever make it any any other way? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, Mark also asks about the ice. He says that he finds that crushed ice is a must for taste and for dilution and presentation. Have you found the same? Um, what was the cocktail I made? There was one, I think it was a Mai Tai I made, and I switch it up from regular ice to crushed ice and actually shook it with crushed ice and it made a huge difference in the cocktail. So what did it actually do? What was the difference? So if you look at like kind of the flavor development of a cocktail over like, you know, 10 minutes or something like that, it did this kind of crazy evolution to the drink where in the beginning it was a little bit unbalanced. Hmm. It was super kind of boozy and a little bit on um, the, the lime skins were kind of like, overpowering and by the time you got about halfway through it it hit this magic window huh. where all the pieces kind of lined up perfectly it, it was it was a cool experience are you sure it wasn't just that you'd had half a cocktail and everything it. tasted well, better well the overproof rum probably had something to do with that too <laughs> um i think the that was the magic the magical the experience right <laughs> No, that's um, a good point. And I think you cannot discount dilution in this business. It is such an important element of your cocktail recipe. And I think that Mark makes a really good point here. It, crushed ice will aid in dilution very, very differently. Right. Absolutely. So at the heart of it, I would experiment. Yeah. Find something that you like. And if you're not running the bar program, show it to the bar manager. Or show the person that's actually making the decisions on the menu and let them taste for themselves. If you come up with a really cool recipe, yeah. you know, if they're not, you know, if it's not an ego thing, then they'll say, oh, yeah, no, that's really good. Let's change the recipe. Yeah, I think the fact of the matter is, I, I mean, as far as I know, there is no right recipe for a mojito. And I think that actually was your actual question is if there is a quote unquote correct way to make one. As far as I know, there isn't. Um, I think there's a lot of different recipes. It, it differs a lot depending on where you go. I have no idea how mojitos are made in Ireland. I could only imagine that they're And they're probably delicious. very different from any mojito made in the Caribbeans. And that's goes for anywhere, right? You know, right. You, you have these regional things that are happening. You don't have the right ingredients or influence or whatever, and they can change. And I'm sure that everybody has their own version of a mojito, just like everybody has their own version of a sour. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy thing. And I don't... It's so true. Yeah. So the yeah. lot of interpretation, especially when you start to look at mixology or whatever you want to call this as yeah. art. Oh, yeah. There's Danger so much zone. interpretation that can happen, <laughs> right? But don't over your mint. And then beyond that, just make what you like. Yeah, and drink a lot of them. You got to build up that data set. <laughs> you don't even like rum. <laughs> oh, mojitos are delicious, though. They're so they good. Are, they are so good. They are so good. The next question I actually found really, really interesting, and it's something that I have wondered about in the past. It's from Justin from Green Bay, and he asks... Go Packers. Go Packers. He did not ask Go Packers, but <laughs> I think it was implied. All right. He asks if there are rules around using a decanter. First of all, he asks about the concern around lead crystal. And secondly, he wonders if there's any issues about putting anything other than scotch or bourbon in a decanter um, with regard to losing or changing its flavor. So that's a really good question. I think if you're decanting something into a decanter, are there concerns around changing flavor over time? You know, um, there are, and this is something I have experienced just in the personal home bar, there were a couple of spirits that I decanted and just put in a glass bottle with a glass top. The thing that happened for me was since the the tops aren't fully sealed, they're not 
that close seal like you would get in a booze bottle, mm-hmm. I actually had an evaporation. Oh. So the proof dropped, the quantity in the bottle dropped, like the angel share. But what's left is this really kind of weak, like almost spirit. That's disappointing. Yeah, because, I mean, if you if you think about the evaporation point, alcohol evaporates much sooner than water. Right, right. right. So that's the first thing that usually evaporates mm-hmm. out. Especially if you keep it on your top shelf. Right. Because that's so, going to be warmer. Or in a sunlight or any of these things. So if you're not holding it for a very long time... As far as a change in flavor, I can't imagine it would be that big of a deal. How long were you holding yours? Well, uh, probably a couple of years. Oh, okay. Yeah, so a good a long time. Spirit said I probably, you know, would have rarely gotten back to mm-hmm. and just needed the bottle for something. Um, but you'll definitely notice a, a change in it. I think I did a, um, a liqueur in there and it, it changed pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but if you're going through the product in, you know, a month or two, I don't know how much that's going to change. Actually... I wouldn't worry about that, probably. If any of the listeners out there it. have any experience with this, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, and especially the question around the lead crystal aspect of it. I don't know a lot about glass. I don't know about the leaching properties, but I imagine just like infusion, you know, the higher proof, the more you're going to leach out. Yeah, good um, question. But I, I, will I say think you'd, you're you'd... holding it longer. It's probably going to leach out more. Yeah, I, I will say that... If I recall, when I've seen decorative glass that has lead in it, the, the crystal, um, it usually says they're not to be used for food. Yeah. So maybe that's just, you know, a more recent sort of liability thing that you're seeing. But um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure I would want to drink anything. But then you look at all those. Uh, maybe this is something different. Like you look at those those bottles that cost like $10,000 cognac and stuff. And one of the like yeah, the they're big supposed things to be like, crystal. Oh, it's crystal. I don't know if it's lead crystal yeah. or it's different. I but... thought crystal always had. Like, see, now we're really beyond. We're just we're just talking. Man, I know. We seriously. don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> I would I would actually love to open this question up to the community because I don't know the answer, and I think especially with anything regard to health, I'd like to know. Yeah, so it, if it's... you know about this, um, let it, let us know in the comments over at mixologytalk.com slash sixty six. And we'll definitely let everyone else know because I think that's one of the things is just communal sharing of this. Knowledge because the last thing we want to do in this business is hurt people absolutely um so if we can kind of put this out there i think that it would uh it would benefit everyone yeah but but for your question about evaporation um i think justin if you're not going to be keeping the your spirits in there for years and years i think you're just fine yeah absolutely. so the moral of the story is drink more yeah yeah but be safe <laughs> All right, our last two questions are from Armando from Oregon. He has a two-part question for us. You're cheating, Armando. <laughs> That's okay. So the first question is around sour mix. And this is a really good question that I have wondered about in the past as well. And he asks, when making sour mix, should I squeeze the lemons and limes or can I use a juicer? And specifically, he's referring to the kind of juicer that you would use to make something like carrot juice. Is there a big difference in flavor? And the second question, is it's around the order of building a drink in a shaker do you put in the ice first or the spirits first right so let's get to the first question and then we'll get into that second one so with the um the juicer you definitely to get the best juice possible you want to use a squeezer whether it be a, a hand squeezer or one of those big industrial like squeezers the ones with the big old lever right and they actually have the or uh, even a powered citrus juicer i think would be fine the key here is that uh, i mean as far as i know if it's a juicer that can handle a carrot it's not designed for citrus right and the big reason behind that is there's a lot of bitterness in the peels in the pith um so if you're using something that shreds like carrots and juices carrots it's going to shred all of that and what you're going to end up with is a really bitter bitter juice and you don't mm-hmm. want that right certainly not for a sour mix exactly um, whereas if you're using a citrus juicer it's going to be designed to pull the juice out of the middle of the fruit and leave the peel alone right and one of the best ways one of the best juicers that i've seen is something like a hand like the hand squeezers or the big industrial presses um, because you want some of the oils from the skins to go into the to the actual um, mix as well because I could see that. it carries a lot of aroma it carries a lot of flavor and you can tell the difference between something that's done on one of those spinny orange uh, juice 
vaping oh, machines. Oh, I don't even know what those are called. Yeah, yeah, but you know what I'm talking about. Like the you have the like the little reamer in the middle, and it just kind of spins around, and, and you, you just press, mash. Yeah, you yeah. press an orange or lemon or lime on top of it. It doesn't extract all those oils, and it tastes very, very different. The oils are really it's important. It's good because it's fresh, but it's not going to be as good if it doesn't have right. those oils in it. Exactly, and it um, carries all those aromas and flavor. But to your point, you're not getting any of the white stuff. The white stuff is where the bitterness is. That's why you want to avoid that when you're making limoncello and uh, liqueurs. Um, similar here. You want you do not want to scrunch up the, the white stuff and squeeze that into your juice as well. So I would um, either invest in a hand squeezer or a, one of those tabletop versions um i'll try to remember to put a link in the comments to the kind that we've referred to in the past um this is it, i think i think it's worth investing in yeah and i know there's a couple um high volume bars that actually have one of those industrial juicers you've seen them probably in the hotel i think they're I zoom x machines the, the ones that make so, so you just walk up and you hit the button and it makes you fresh squeezed orange right juice. it just starts like I dropping oranges those. and lemons and limes but i could watch those forever those are really good as well because um you know you get a lot of volume in a very short amount of time uh, you get a little bit of the oil extraction and i mean 30 minutes you have buckets of lime <laughs> and lemon juice so if you need buckets and buckets of sour <laughs> mix armanto that is the way to go for sure yeah exactly it's like <laughs> investing in your future i mean think about all the labor you're gonna save oh it's gonna gosh. pay for itself oh my gosh <laughs> this is like the podcast of bad advice sometimes. oh terrible advice <laughs> terrible <laughs> So the second question that Armando asked was the steps of building a cocktail. Um, do you add the booze first? Do you add the ice first? What is the order that you always build in? And for me, it depends on the cocktails. Like you have build cocktails where you just build them in a glass over ice. But for the most part, if it has like lime juice or if you're going to be shaking it, I always add ice last. Why is that? Because if you like, let's say you make a two-part cocktail, like a Jack and Coke or a rum and Coke or whatever gin and tonics um gin and coke and you fill the glass up with ice which is how i was trained to do it gin and cokes <laughs> i've never tried it it might be it awesome. sounds terrible but if you fill your glass up with ice like i was trained you pour the booze in what you'll notice is that the ice quickly begins to um disintegrate in the water melt is another technical I like term disintegrate. <laughs> It just explodes everywhere. That's but, a different podcast episode. <laughs> yeah, flashback, sorry. But it'll start to melt immediately. So that's why I like to add it last. So if you build out your cocktail, you know, you add your booze, you add your mixer, whatever it is, and then you add your ice, you've already kind of dropped the proof down of the spirits. It's going to it's going to melt the ice a little bit less. So it'll kind of preserve the integrity of the, of the spirit a little bit more. I will say, um, and not to disagree with you, Chris, because I don't know what I'm talking about, um, but I will say that I've heard a lot of disagreement on this topic. Everybody feels very, very strongly, and uh, they don't all agree. So I'm not sure that it matters that much. It really doesn't. Yeah. Do what works for you or do whatever you feel like. I, I think you're going to find strong feelings on both sides of the, of the camp on this one. Right. And um, the only advice I have, like a lot lot of the topics we talk about and the things that are so uncertain yeah just you know they're all up in the air there's no real answer just experiment find, like find do side by like. side yeah you know like and that's it i mean pour one pour another taste it see what's better for you if they taste the and same move on. don't worry about it <laughs> right exactly <laughs> you know then go with whatever's faster but um just have fun yeah, I, I, I'm with you on this one. I don't think I, I don't think this is something worth phoning home about. I don't think it's the end of the world. If you're working in a super, super crazy high end cocktail bar um, that really focuses on the sort of art and shall I say craftiness, the, the performance of right. creating a cocktail, it may matter. But if your manager doesn't tell you it matters, then I say it doesn't matter. Right. Absolutely. So but nobody asked me. No, no. And I'm sure we're going to get a lot of. <laughs> Hate comments on this question. I know, I know. Um, but like I said, just experiment, have fun, and answer the question, you know, and just enjoy the process. Exactly. Do your own testing. So that's it for this week. Four questions from three folks all over the world. If you have your own questions, definitely let us know over at mixologytalk.com slash 66. Or you can actually email us directly at questions at mixologytalk.com. And once again, let us know in those comments if you are interested in us doing a live recording. I think it might be kind of fun to uh, to see you guys in the chat box, see what you're asking, and then we can't get out of uh, the questions that are really hard. Yeah, we, we 
can't go months without answering your questions. It's true. And I will say one thing. Uh, this is something that Julie and I were talking about. You can say more than one thing. It's your podcast. <laughs> Actually, yeah, it'd be it'd be surprising if I only said one thing, right? Um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier was the fact that how much we love doing the listener questions. It's one of my favorite episodes. Absolutely, these these are so much fun. I think it's it's really neat to hear what you guys are working on, the questions that you have. So I think we'd like to do more of them. Yeah, absolutely. If so, you're into that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, leave your questions for us. We love doing these and uh, we, I don't know I, I just get really excited when I see all the questions I get all tingly inside when I see the questions coming in I think that might have been the cocktail or three three yeah <laughs> alright everyone we'll see you in a couple weeks have a cheers. good shift cheers everyone cheers never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube and as always check out the show notes by clicking on the right